question and I'll stop and we'll, we'll address your question. The document that I'm sharing today is um, my doctoral thesis for a doctor of ministry in preaching. And it is specifically uh, focused on alternative preaching styles to engage younger listeners. So what I'm gonna do now is go ahead and share that and we'll get started. And once again, feel free to ask questions as they come up. Um, and I wanna make sure I can get this up. There we go. Now, are you seeing this? Yeah, screen looks the same on my end as it did before. All right. Yeah, not, um, not, not yet. All right. Um, I did share screen, but let me come back to you and see if maybe it needed to be up. Now let's try it. I don't know why it's, it's up. Oh, I remember. We needed to, I need to go to window. Sorry, there we go. Ha. I have never used um, Teams before. There, is that up? There we go. Excellent. There it is. All right, I don't want, I want it full screen and I'm going to begin. Okay, so <laughs> that's me that everyone is pointing to. This is the name of my doctoral thesis. Um, I, I was in a small uh, Norwegian congregation in South Central Wisconsin when I entered the Doctor of Ministry program. And so what we're talking about is um, alternative preaching styles in a postmodern culture. And how is that different? So in order to do that, uh, we have to go back and look at what modernism is. And modernism began with Martin Luther and the printing of the Bible in the language of the people. So that was a major cultural shift into what became modernism because the culture became a literate culture. And it's very strange to think of the fact that we have been in modernism from basically the 16th well into the 20th century. And so we have recently entered into what everyone under, is using as a post-modern culture. And I'm not gonna talk about whether we have now entered into a post-postmodern culture because I think it's a distinction without a difference. So what we're dealing with now as we enter into a postmodern culture is we're dealing with a lack of objective universal truth. Truth is understood now as subjective and relative by the culture. Well, obviously that has massive impact in terms of the culture's relationship to the church, big T, big C. And so truth is felt and experienced. It is not reached through reason and logic. Now, the roots of postmodernism go back to the 19th century with Nietzsche, Marx, Darwin, philosophically. And so what I've done, what I did was, I put together a presentation that I share with congregations, districts, fellowships, et cetera, addressing the challenges of the church in a postmodern culture. And so this is the title image for the presentation that I share when I come to congregations. I'm actually gonna be sharing this presentation with the uh, Illinois Fellowship of the LCMC on May 9th uh, in person. And so, some of what I share today is going to be from the presentation and things that I have gleaned since my doctoral thesis. And a large portion of that will be from the doctoral thesis itself. A lot of what I received, what I got from my doctoral thesis comes from Dr. Leonard Sweet and uh, his books. 
So what I want to do talking about the tw um, 21st century is we need to talk about generations. The main generations that we're referring to as we uh, are well into the postmodern age now are of course builders, which is the World War II generation, boomers, which was the largest generation, but no longer is. Um, busters is kind of an in-between generation. And so what I wanna do to kind of frame the issue is share what we have been experiencing in the church. I wanna talk about generations. What the church has experienced for some time now is uh, someone reaches um, high school or college, depending on the church, and he stops coming to worship. But the church wasn't really concerned about that too much because they thought to themselves, well, that's okay because eventually this guy is going to get married. And when he gets married, he's going to come back to church. And he does. He gets married and he and his wife come for the wedding ceremony. And then they stop coming to church. But the church wasn't really concerned about that because they thought to themselves, you know, this they're going to have kids. And when they have children, they're going to want those children baptized. And they did. They had children. They wanted their children baptized. They came into the church. They got their children baptized. And they stopped coming to church. And the church wasn't real concerned about that because they thought to themselves, you know, they're going to want their kids in Sunday school. So they're going to come back for Sunday school. And, and they do. The parents decide that Sunday school is a good thing for their kids. And so they want to bring their kids to Sunday school. So they drop them off for Sunday school. They drop them off for Sunday school. They're still not in worship. And then the church decides, well, that's okay, because during confirmation, they have to come to worship. They have to come to worship during confirmation, and they do. And then the kid gets confirmed, and mom and dad stop coming to church. Well, why? Well, he's confirmed. This is the guy that, as a high school student, stopped coming to church. And what happened was, along the way, there was a generation that looked at what their parents were doing and basically decided, if that's what church is all about, who needs it? What's the point of that? So they stopped, they didn't come back. And they were labeled Generation X. And Generation X is almost 50 years old now. They were called the lost generation. And then came the next generation. <clears throat> they were literally called Generation Next. That's my daughter's gener generation. They're also called millennials. We see all the time people talking about millennials. What are we going to do about getting millennials back in church? My daughter graduated from high school in 2001, the new millennium. So they're referred to as Generation Next, the millennials, or Generation Y, because, of course, they came after X. They are the second lost generation. I wrote my master's or my doctoral thesis in 2006. And when I did my doctoral thesis, I referred to the then teenagers as generation three because they were waiting in line to become the third lost generation. Now in the material, they're referred to as generation Z. And generation Z, according to Dr. Sweet and the data has now become the third lost generation to the church. So we're gonna look at uh, some of Dr. Sweet's books and how they relate to this issue of postmodernism. So in my doctoral thesis, the metaphor that I used is to look at postmodernism as a language. I've been serving in the country of Latvia in Northern Europe formerly occupied by Russia for 30 years since the end of the occupation. And I use this connection as part of my doctoral thesis because when I was in Latvia for the first time in September of 1992, everybody spoke Russian. 
they had been occupied for 50 years. Everybody spoke Russian. Well, by the time I wrote my doctoral thesis in 2006, and I was there every year for 30 years, among young people, maybe 20 to 25% of young people today, people under the age of 30, 35, speak Russian. Why? They don't need to. They're not occupied anymore. They speak Latvian. They speak English. They speak lots of languages. But the only young people who are learning Russian today in Latvia are young people that have chosen to go to school and learn Russian. So one of the points that I try to make is postmodernism is a language. And modernism is a language. And one of the things that we're seeing in the church is that since the 16th century, the church speaks modern and the culture speaks postmodern. And those are different languages. We might as well be doing worship in Latin. For, for the impact that we're having, we might as well be doing worship in Latin. So I wanna talk about ways that the church has responded to postmodernism. One of the ways that the church has responded, I, I've noted three. One is the ostrich approach. I've heard speakers basically say, um, it's not happening, it's not happening, uh, I don't want to hear it, I can't hear you, um, ostrich approach. And of course, hiding your head in the sand does not make postmodernism go away. Among some of our more conservative brothers, we I've seen what I call railing against it. Some conservative Christians will pound the pulpit and they'll yell at their people to try to make them not be postmodern when postmodernism is the culture that they're going back into as soon as they're done. Now, in the denomination that I left when I became LCMC, in the ELCA and other mainline denominations, they take the third approach. The third approach is accommodation. Subjective relative truth, sure, why not? We'll just forget that there is any objective uh, universal truth, and we'll simply go with the flow. We'll go with this. We'll go downstream, and we will treat church as if it is not objectively and universally true. So, what Dr. Sweet has proposed is a fourth response of the church, and the response that I promote in my doctoral thesis is change the method and never change the message. So that is the approach that Dr. Sweet took. The, um, in 2003, I read his book, Aqua Church, and I was driven into the Doctor of Ministry program and preaching because after reading this book, I came, I came to the conclusion, we've got to do something. Our young people are graduating from church and they have been for quite a long time. Dr. Sweet also wrote Soul Tsunami, and he wrote a more recent book called Giving Blood. But in Aqua Church and Soul Tsunami, he shared what's called the Platinum Rule. Everybody knows the Golden Rule. The Platinum Rule is, what would Jesus have me do? And so the underlying principle of his book is, I will put the living water into any container from which someone will drink. The living water never changes. Containers can change. We can't be Pharisees about containers. But the living water never changes. So the platinum rule, and I've used it with grandparents and great grandparents. What are you willing, what are you prepared to add to keep your grandchildren and great grandchildren in church in worship lifelong? What are you willing to add? What are you willing to remove to encourage your grandchildren and great grandchildren to remain in worship connected to the church lifelong? And that's his application. 
of the platinum rule. And in giving blood, he frames this mindset as church needs to become epic. So there, so we talked about four possible responses of the church. And so the, the idea of giving blood is that church would become epic, experiential, participatory, image rich, community and connective. And when I speak, people ask me, okay, if you're saying postmodernism is a language, what's the language of postmodernism? This is it. The reason this connects is because this is postmodern language. So my doctoral thesis was basically, is it possible to use postmodern language in preaching to share a message that is both universal and objectively true? And the point of my doctoral thesis was that yes, that is possible to speak postmodern and not lapse into relative subjective truth. So what Dr. Sweet talks about is it's e people use stories all the time now and people think by using stories they've got it covered. But stories can be used inductively or deductively. What Dr. Sweet is advocating for is what he calls adductive make the sermon itself a narrative. And so the, 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 the word that he coined is narrative and metaphor, narrative. And the point that he makes was really interesting. I had the opportunity twice to hear him lecture in person. And the example that he uses is Super Bowl commercials. Millions and millions of dollars go into Super Bowl commercials. And if you watch Super Bowl commercials today, what you see is that commercial after commercial after commercial has no words at all. There's no words. There's pictures and there's a story. Now, since Giving Blood came out, I saw that in the Olympics commercials. The best example that I saw was in the, uh, there was a commercial, it was uh, very powerful. There was a, a young woman swimmer in the Paralympics and she had no legs. And she's multi-record holder. She's the most decorated um, uh, Paris, Paralympian in swimming. And so the commercial is her swimming and she was adopted from Eastern Europe. And in the commercial, her mom, her adoptive mom is on the phone with the adoption agency. And the adoption agency is telling her all the limitations that this girl is gonna have. And while she's swimming in the pool, one image laid on the other, and she stops swimming as a, as a grown up, looks up at her mom, talking about her as, a, as a, an infant. And her mom says, no, it's gonna be amazing. And I share that when I do my presentation with people to help them understand. I ask them, what are they selling? What's the commercial for? And nobody knows. Nobody remembers what the commercial's for. It's Toyota cars. Well, it has nothing to do with Toyota cars, but the, the, they use image and story to get their attention. So what I want to do is I want to do that. I want to share a couple stories, two of which are from my doctoral thesis. One has been added since then. What I'm promoting in my doctoral thesis is a variety of preaching styles because we have a variety of people in our congregation. In a congregation that has no young people at all, nobody under the age of 40, this won't make any sense. Uh, in a congregation where everybody is under 40, this won't make any sense. But in most of our congregations, we have a wide variety of generations included in our worshiping community. My passion, the reason I started doing this is uh, I want the children 
to stay connected to worship. So this, I found this image, it's great. The story that I share is, I'm old enough to remember when our family got the first black and white TV. We loved that black and white TV. We watched it all the time. It was me and my younger brother, mom and dad, just like in the picture. And we only had the one TV. On one night, we would watch boxing, wrestling, football, because that's what my dad wanted to watch. Another night, we would watch Lawrence Welk. I hated Lawrence Welk. I still hate Lawrence Welk. But we watched it because we were a family. And that's what my mom wanted to watch. And another night, we would be rolling on the floor, laughing with tears in our eyes, watching Woody Woodpecker or um, Heckle and Jekyll, because that's what my brother and I wanted to watch. The point being, for most of our congregations, we only have one worship service. And we have multiple generations in that worship service. What I'm promoting is the mindset that we need to be willing to share that one worship service with everyone in the family of God in order to connect all generations to the church lifelong. Rotating worship style, rotating preaching style. And that's what I modeled in my calls and that's what I model as an interim pastor. So I want to go back to Latvia. This is old Riga. I began lecturing on alternative preaching styles in Latvia in 2005. I began teaching at the Lutheran Seminary in Riga, Latvia um, in 2007. And when I was teaching at the Lutheran Seminary, there's an interesting discussion took place. An, an older pastor who was in the seminary getting his master's degree uh, said to me during one of my presentations, this doesn't apply to me because uh, we have no young people in our community. And I said to him, oh, I understand. You don't have a high school. He said to me, no, 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 we do have a high school. And I said, okay, how many students do you have in your high school? And he said, well, it's a small high school. There's only 60. And I said, okay, then you have 60 young people in your community. And I tell you the truth, he put his hand over his mouth and was just stunned because he had never done the math. I said to him, it's not that you don't have young people in your community, you don't have young people in your worship service. You need to be asking yourself why you have no young people in your worship service when you've got 60 young people in your community and none of them come to worship. So that's why I do this. More recently, I had the opportunity to share some of my experiences in Latvia. And I shared the story of a, um, uh, an interesting pastor that I know. He was expelled from Latvia during the occupation because he kept converting people to Christ and discipling people. And the communist Russians couldn't have that, so they kicked him out of the country. After freedom, he was allowed to come back in and he was a pastor, he was on the parliament, and he's a pretty amazing guy. He was the Soviet middleweight amateur boxing champion with a black belt in Taekwondo and an ordained pastor. And I got, I, I visited Latvia and we had, we had coffee together and he was really excited. He was telling me, Bob, I just did this children's mission trip all across Latvia. And it was amazing. Um, I brought with me the world's strongest man who actually the ESPN world's strongest man was a Latvian. He said, the other person I brought with me was the Miss Universe contestant from the country of Latvia, who's a strong Christian woman. And the three of us went from city to city to city, sharing Christ with young people gathered in every city that we went to. And he said, it was, Bob, the next time I go, I want you to come. You're coming with us the next time we go. 
Well, I got back, I got done with the trip and I came home and I always debrief with my wife. And so I was debriefing the trip with my wife and sharing this with her. And when I got done sharing it, my wife said to me, okay, Bob, let me get this straight. A former member of parliament who's, who's a black belt in Taekwondo and the former amateur middleweight boxing champion of the Soviet Union, the world's strongest man, literally. The Miss Universe contestant for Latvia. And Bob? And we had a good laugh. But then what I shared with her was the reason that Eric was inviting me to come on the trip was not to speak to the children. That would be silly. What happened was in each city that they went to, young people accepted Christ, entered into the Lutheran churches. And by the time he was telling me about this, most of them had left. Most of those children had left out the back door because those churches were not positioned to receive the students that were being sent into them. So basically, they had no idea what was going on in church. They had no understanding of what was being said. And they eventually just left out the back door. And by the time he told me about it, they were almost gone. So that's what my doctoral thesis is basically about. So I wrote on postmodern preaching to connect with younger worshipers. And I wanna cover that really briefly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at different postmodern preaching styles. Here they are. There's one other, there's a sixth one that I wanna to touch on very briefly. So this is, these are ways of doing postmodern preaching to connect with younger worshipers. So the first one is single narrative. So I put that picture up there because the first sermon that I did for the doctoral program on single narrative, or actually the, the um, third sermon that I did as a single narrative was um, Peter and John healing the man who couldn't walk in Acts three and four. But the first one that I did was actually a dream sequence allegory. And so what I wanted people to do was to experience objective universal truth. So what I, I created a series of vignettes, very similar to what C.S. Lewis did in um, uh, The Great Divorce, and then presented in the sermon these vignettes to help people see, um, experience 1 Corinthians chapter one and the foolishness of the cross in a way that they would retain. The objective is to use postmodern language to share an objective universal truth. In this case, the theology of the cross. In the third sermon, when I told that story um, of Acts three and four, basically what I did was in worship, I told the story, Acts three, Acts four with explanation all the way through single narrative. After the worship service was over, it was a turning point in my doctoral studies. We had an adult study that met after worship, so I met with them. And I asked the seniors in my congregation, what did you get out of the sermon today? They said to me, there was no sermon today. We waited for a sermon. The sermon never came. You told a story. There was no sermon. As part of the Doctor of Ministry program, you have a, a sermon review team. And my team was half older and half younger, moderns and postmoderns. So that evening, I met with my team and I asked them the very same question. What did you get out of the sermon today? My 40-year-old said to me, 
The same Holy Spirit that was in the Apostle Peter is in us in baptism. We have access to the same Spirit that filled Peter when he taught. My high school student, my high school um, junior, I think she was, said, Peter was so brave in sharing his faith. I want to be brave as Peter was in sharing his faith. So the postmoderns got something from the sermon in a way that the moderns didn't. And that was huge for me because it showed me that in a, if you went into a congregation and you preached only using postmodern language and postmodern preaching styles, most seniors would have no idea what you're talking about. On the other hand, if you continue using traditional preaching methods in congregations where you have Sunday school and confirmation students, you're going to continue to lose them and they're going to continue to graduate from church. And so that was a huge part of what I got from that, um, from that particular sermon. And that's where the title came from, preaching to a new generation so that none are lost or left behind. Because if you do postmodern language all the time, your seniors will feel left behind. If you never speak in postmodern language in worship, your young people will be lost. And that's why I'm promoting rotation of preaching styles and rotation of worship styles, just for that reason. So the key, one of the key thinkers in this area is the late Richard Jensen, who was my favorite professor at Lutheran School of Theology, Chicago. Um, upper left is his um, introductory book, Thinking and Story, The Use of Narrative in Preaching. And the other book that you see there is really important. He did a, a whole series of preaching commentaries, narrative preaching commentaries on the Synoptic Gospels. Um, I have all three, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I use them all the time um, for help in framing narrative sermons. So the next one, I'm, and if you, anytime there are questions, just jump right in. I can't see you, but feel free to ask. How are we doing? Are we good? You have our, you have our attention, so keep going. All right. Yeah, there'll be time for discussion afterwards, obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. So the second one I want to cover quickly is a multiple narrative. Um, so these images are actually from a multiple narrative sermon that I did on um, forgiveness, repentance and forgiveness. We've got a David, Moses, Jonah, and then Jesus, the parables were the coin and the sheep. And so I, I told each of these narratives as part of that sermon to help people get a sense of repentance and absolution, forgiveness, so that they could appreciate both the sinfulness of the situation, of course I use the golden calf, and they can appreciate the completeness of specifically that they would experience the joy of salvation. And so that is a multiple narrative sermon. Now, this is this is what I want to address. And this is an example of using stories versus preaching as story. Lots of pastors now go and get stories and put them in their sermons, but there's a difference between using a story to make a point and letting the story be the point. You're not illustrating, you're allowing them to experience it through the story itself. And so using stories as a part of preaching helps, but it doesn't go the whole way in terms of giving them the opportunity to experience as story. In this particular class, one of the things, um, the 
teachers of the course that I took for this were actually actors. And they talked about sermon as performance. And one of the things they shared, which was really helpful to me, is lose the preacher voice. A Christian comedian called that REV, and it has nothing to do with going backwards. Um, what happens to our voice when we preach? The voice that we use in delivering a sermon should be the voice that we're using, at least when we're doing postmodern preaching, needs to be the same voice that we greeted people at the door, both coming in and going out. We don't have reverend voice. We don't use preacher voice. We um, use our voice in sharing. Now, part of the, the importance of being able to uh, use postmodern preaching, including preaching without manuscript, preaching away from the pulpit, is in terms of our current culture, one of the, one of the important studies demonstrated that 60% of what people get out of our sermon comes from body language. 25% of what people get out of our sermon comes from tone, oral. The rest, 15%, comes from the words that we use. That, that's astounding. 15% of what people are receiving from us is the actual words that we're speaking. That's a cultural thing. Now, I'm convinced that for seniors, that percentage is significantly higher, but not all the people in our congregation are seniors. Um, one of the things I shared also is uh, when you're doing narrative preaching, it's very tempting to just preach the parables of Jesus. And, and you will hear teach, preaching gurus telling you about preaching the parables of Jesus. One of the caveats that I've shared is most of the people when we study the Gospels, when Jesus shared a parable, they didn't know what he was talking about. So just sharing a parable of Jesus is certainly narrative, but you can't assume that anybody understands anything because they didn't then. So another technique that is very helpful when you're preaching from na uh, multiple narratives is what I call using an antiphon, a phrase that repeats. It's like a bell for them. Every time they hear that phrase, they make a connection. So we're preaching as story, not simply preaching with stories. So as I shared, those are the, these are the narratives that I shared when talking about repentance and forgiveness. So this is, um, the next one is single image. Uh, when I led a, a workshop in the country of Latvia with pastors on alternative preaching styles, we uh, arranged to be in a congregation, a uh, worship space that was just surrounded by statuary and, and paintings. And so what I did in the workshop was I assigned them to choose an image and then to work through a description of the image, why, I, why they chose it and what it meant to them as a way of beginning to preach without notes. That, of course, can also be done with narrative to take a favorite Bible story and just tell the story. We don't need notes to tell a story that we know well from the Bible. So preaching from a single image allows us to get into a significant amount of detail regarding the image. And of course the image is gonna to relate directly to the, um, the, the lectionary text. I preach from the lectionary. Um, so I wanna share a couple of examples. Baptism of Jesus. Now, of course, I got permission from the artist to use these images in worship. So I've used this for a single, ish, a single image sermon on the festival of the baptism of Jesus. 
So I'll give you a sec, I'll give you a minute, a second. I just, one of the things I like, Dave, you've got the, um, you've got the hoodie on for the chosen. I noticed you've, and I love, I lo I've got the t-shirt, um, get used to different. One of the things I love about the chosen is that it shows Jesus's full range of emotions. Um, Jesus has a sense of humor. Jesus experiences joy. Jesus smiles sometimes. And so we are really inundated with the serious Jesus. And so when I saw this image, I, I contacted the artist and got permission to use it. And then this one. This is a very popular image on Facebook. It's called First Day in Heaven. And so I, it's um, valuable for the joy of salvation. It's valuable for talking about um, on All Saints, the passages from Revelation. So these are powerful images that can be used uh, as, as the sermon. So multiple images. One of the things that Dr. Sweet shares is that uh, there are two denominations globally that are not in decline. One denomination that is not in decline, even in the United States, is Pentecostalism. That's a thing. Uh, he talks about the Azusa Street Revival and Pentecostalism as the third wave of Christianity after the second wave of the Reformation. The other, interestingly, that is not in decline worldwide is Eastern Orthodox. And he points out that Eastern Orthodox worship is epic especially with regard to images. And so when I do my presentation to lay people, I, I share with them being in an Eastern Orthodox church and moving from image to image to image. So these images come from the sermon that I did for my uh, project sermon on multiple images. All of these images focus on uh, Christ the center. So the framework, the skeleton of my sermon was Bonhoeffer's Christ the Center. And then each of the images that I used illustrated that, um, the idea of Christ the Center. The one on the left is St. John the Divine Cathedral in Washington, I think it's Washington, DC. And then the one, the second one is called Pantocrator. The, the one, the third one, of course, is Cronach's Crucifixion, which is in the um, Art Institute of Chicago. And then interestingly, the image of the um, sunflower was not an image that I used during the sermon. It's a verbal image. I described it. And sometimes you can use images that are not put up. You can use an image that you build in the imagination through your use of words. And one of the reviewing um, teachers in the program said that for him at least, and, and several of my congregation members said the same, the most vi vivid image of the sermon for them was the one that they didn't see. It was the one that they imagined as I described it to them of the sunflower turning throughout the day to keep its face toward the sun. I want to say a word about blended, uh, blended worship and blended sermons. The book on the left is a really good book by Graham Standish. And what he does in that book is promote the idea of blended worship services in terms of our current culture. Uh, the book on the right was a part of my doctoral work. Uh, it's by Jeter and Allen, One Gospel, Many Ears. And they did a very intensive study on the different uh, demographics within each congregation. And they promoted a form of preaching which connected with multiple subcultures within the congregation. So basically it's a blended sermon. As one of my project sermons, I decided that I wanted to experiment with this. 
and I did a blended sermon where there was something in the sermon for everyone. And I did it. And then when I reported it out as part of my doctoral thesis, and the doctoral thesis, by the way, is available um, for free uh, as a, a digital Word document. I reported in my doctoral thesis that this was my least favorite sermon to do of all the sermons. And I have shared that blended worship is my least favorite form of worship. The reason is this. The metaphor that I use is I imagine being at a, a pizza party where everybody gets one square of pizza. So everybody got to have pizza and nobody's satisfied. That, that was my sense, that was my experience of preaching a, um, a blended sermon which connected with everyone in a small way throughout the sermon. It was, I don't think, it, I don't think it's satisfying. Everybody gets a taste and they go, oh yeah, that was my piece. And, and that's, that's a concern that I have for blended worship as well. I mean, Standish does a really good job of, of uh, promoting blended worship. And, and we do blended worship at the church I'm serving now. But I get that same sense. It, to go back to my television image, um, what if we were sitting in front of that screen and we watched one channel that my dad wanted to watch one show my dad wanted to watch for 10 minutes and then one show my mom wanted to watch for 10 minutes and then one show that my brother and I wanted to watch for 10 minutes and just cycled that nobody would be happy and so I acknowledge that you can do a sermon it's hard work you can do a sermon where there is literally something for everyone in every sermon I don't think it's satisfying for anyone, but I want to include it because Jeter and Alan do a good job of talking about it. And it is a thing. It is an option. And so I want to spend a little bit more time before we're done, which we almost are on mystagogical preaching. My advisor at Lutheran School of Theology, Chicago in the Doctor of Ministry Preaching Program was Craig Satterley who left the uh, Doctor of Ministry program at Lutheran School of Theology, Chicago, to become the bishop of the ELCA um, Central Michigan Synod. So he's not there anymore. But Dr. Craig Satterley literally wrote the book on mystagogical preaching. So I wanna take a few minutes on mystagogical preaching. Uh, mystagogical preaching is something that uh, Bishop Ambrose made good use of in, I believe it's the fourth century, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And what he did was in, in this, he wanted to do something that was pedagogical, but was experiential. Because remember, we've got modernism in the 16th century, and we've got um, the enlightenment following that, the age of reason, and now we're in a, a postmodern culture and there are very strong similarities between postmodern culture and pre-modern culture. And so that's why Dr. Satterley did his investigation of mystagogical, mystagogical preaching and specifically that which was done um, substantially by Bishop Ambrose. And what mystagogical preaching is, is a series of images and narratives. So you can already see it's postmodern. It was pre-modern, it's postmodern. It's images and metaphors from culture, um, from scripture and from nature. And it's constructed by layering these one on top of another. And the, the um, teaching is conveyed by the experience of the weight of the examples, the images, the metaphors. 
And so what this is used for by um, Ambrose is teaching on the parts of worship, the ordo. My first um, mystagogical sermon in the doctoral program, I taught on confession absolution. In my last um, sermon, there are eight sermons, project sermons in the demon program. My last one was using a mystagogical sermon to talk about the offering. And I have also done a mystagogical sermon regarding communion. Uh, and it can be done at any part of the worship. So on the one hand, this type of preaching is very engaging to young people because you move relatively quickly from image to image to image to image as you're walking your way through. So it's very good, even on a longer sermon, at keeping people's attention because of the movement that takes place. So that's the advantage of it. The disadvantage that I'm seeing as um, church worship continues to change is that more and more congregate churches are moving away from the ordo as a structure for their worship. So if churches aren't doing confession absolution, if churches aren't doing the Kyrie or the um, hymn of praise or that if, if you're not doing the order of worship, then some of the value of mystagogical sermon is reduced because you have fewer topics to apply it to. But as long as we're baptizing, as long as we're um, granting absolution, as long as we're giving communion and receiving an offering, as long as we're blessing, there are opportunities to use mystagogical preaching. And that was the conclusion of my doctoral thesis, is that mystagogical preaching is something that I don't think, I don't hear talked about a lot. And there is a lot of potential for connecting with younger people using mystagogical preaching as a way of connecting them with a worship service while they're in worship. So last is the why. Our Sunday school students and confirmation students are currently generation four. Our Sunday school students and confirmation students are in line for a lifetime of connection to the church or the fourth lost generation. And the reason I do this, the reason I meet with congregations, the, the, perp, the, the, the premise of my presentation that I do with congregations is that the reason the congregations struggle so much with change is because there's a lack of appreciation for the drastic change that has occurred in our culture. That if congregations had a better understanding of how drastically the culture has changed, they might have a better appreciation for the drastic nature of addressing those changes in the culture because the reality is hard but true. The definition of insanity has not changed. You can't do things the same way and expect a different result. And so what I'm promoting to pastors and to congregations is that the message never changes. I mean, that's huge in the LCMC and in the NALC. Um, in my presentation, I speak aggressively against progressive Christianity, which I call the virus the spiritual virus of the 21st century. The message never changes, but methods need to. Methods need to change. Translating the gospel into culture has actually been going on for thousands of years. And one of the most inspirational innovators in church history was Martin Luther. So I believe that we can retain 
young people in, our, in the life of the congregation. If we are willing to change methods, if we're willing to speak postmodern in worship, if we speak their native language, then they will understand what it is that we're trying to share and they will feel welcomed. Sometimes in a presentation, what I'll do is just launch into Latvian. Um, but you ne separate to vis. So what would it be like to sit through an entire worship service of that? Now I know, because I have. Um, and I speak Latvian, but not fluently. If we can help our builder and boomer members understand that Gen Z doesn't understand, we can get permission, that permission to speak postmodern in worship, both in how we lead worship and how we preach. Questions? Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for sharing in your presentation. Uh, any questions, comments, thoughts? Um, we're going to stop recording. So um, in this case, I'm going to stop recording. And then... Uh,